right, good evening. Stand with me if you will. Take your songbooks, page 452. Make me a blessing. We're going to do all three verses of page 452. and byways of life many are weary and sad but carry the sunshine where darkness is ripe making the sorrowing glad make me a blessing make me a blessing out of my life may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Tell the sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine, make me a blessing, oh say. sound engineer and uh, engineer engineer most churches have a sound man an audio man well, you know, that we, we don't we uh, we're a step above a couple steps above sound engineers and uh, so we have high expectations because of that so don't let it happen again all right I'm gonna make a few announcements tonight and we'll move forward into our service um, let's see ladies Bible study February the 13th, Tuesday, February the 13th at 6.30 p.m. And so keep that in mind, ladies. If you plan to be here, there is a sign-up sheet for that. That is the fifth of a total of seven sessions. And then, of course, there will be, I believe, a break in the summer, and then it'll start back in the fall. I believe that's how that works. Is that correct, Ms. Carroll? All right. And so fifth of seven, and there'll be a break, and then it'll start back up um, after the summer. And so keep that in mind, ladies, Bible study. Um, after the service tonight, if you didn't get an opportunity to, go to the table that Ms. Geneva has set up for the Valentine's cards for veterans. There's a write-up to explain everything that, that, um, that, that they're desiring and, and what the veterans home is requesting and why. And so read that and, uh, and then fill out a card. And uh, really, you don't have to do any work other than sign your name to a card, fill out a card. Uh, they'll put the track in the card. They'll put a stamp on it. They'll mail it, deliver it, however they're going to do that. And so help them out with that. Must be, a, as that song said, a blessing to these veterans. Um, and then adopt a missionary sign-up sheet as well. And so keep that in mind. If you want to adopt a missionary this year, there's a sign-up sheet. All you have to do is sign your name beside whichever one or two or three that you want to adopt. And 
and uh, I believe by their name will tell where they're located, where they're serving, and and so you will learn a lot about them through the course of this year by com communication that they send to our church. You'll get a copy of everything we receive, and then we just ask that once a quarter you you write them a letter, let them know you have been praying for them, and then you'll turn that in here at the church. We'll mail it for you. All right, I don't know if any other announcements. Brother Mark will be preaching here momentarily. Brother Mark Thrift will say more about that um, as well here, here momentarily. Had a good mission band meeting at 5 o'clock to start preparation for our upcoming missions conference. And uh, speaking of our missions conference for the next two Sunday nights, um, the February the, I guess that's 11th and 18th, uh, Brother Mark's going to preach on both of those Sunday nights and do, do some teaching and preaching on on missions and specifically uh, grace giving, faith promise, things like that. And so that, that will be good to refresh our memory. And then, of course, this is uh, going to be brand new for some, and so he'll introduce that to you. And so you'll want to be here for that, and uh, that, that'll be a real blessing. And so he'll say more about that hopefully momentarily. But he'll be preaching tonight. You pray for him. All right. But again, I don't know of any other announcements, so let's sing a few more songs. Page 470, Footsteps of Jesus. We're going to do all four verses of 470. After we do the first two verses on that chorus, let's have a little time of fellowship, okay? I'll let you know then. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard thee calling. Come, follow me. And we see where the footprint calling leads us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that may Seven, stand up, stand up for Jesus, all four verses. And fellows, by the way, in case you didn't get the email or text, after this song, come on up because you're singing tonight special, okay? Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must. 
must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Strength to strength the foes. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on with prayer. Our duty calls our name. strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him who overcometh the crown of life shall be. Be with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Suppose you can bring a song book with you like to, page 585. Ladies, you can be seated. So come on, fellas, come on down. Gentlemen, Lee thought now that he's 50 years old, he don't have to, he don't have to come up here and join us. But uh, we got him up there. It wouldn't have sounded near as good if Lee wouldn't have been up here with us either. So, amen. All right, Brother Mark's going to preach for us tonight, and uh, I asked him a few weeks back if he would uh, give us this Sunday, and so we're looking forward to that. You pray for him, and I know you will. And listen intently as God is is 
uh, using him all over all over the country, and we're we're certainly fortunate that he's preaching for us tonight. But Mark, you preach for us. Brother West, preach. I'm having a little bit of an identity crisis. <clears throat> Brother Paul just called me a young man. That makes me feel good. As he was going off, he said, young man. Uh, and then the last time I played baseball with Brian and them, uh, I told him, I said, now y'all going to have to have somebody run from me if I get, for me, from me, for me if I get on base. And the first time up, I singled to left field, and they had someone come and run. And as I was going in the dugout, one of the young men who I, I didn't even know who he was, he just looked at me and said, hey, old man, that was a pretty good hit. <laughs> I stopped, looked at him. I said, what'd you call me? <laughs> <laughs> so I walked over to Johnny. I said, tell me now, tell me the truth. Do I look old out here? Because if I do, I'm going home right now. <laughs> I'm not going any further. So I'm in a quandary, Brother Paul. <laughs> but I thank you for helping me tonight. I thank you so very much. Well, it's good to see you tonight. I do greet you in the lovely and precious name of the Lord Jesus. I need to make you aware of a situation that you may not be aware of. I have had to, at the last minute, cancel my mission trip to Turkey. And I'm very sad about that. But the reason why is Joni and I are going for our annual checkups. And she had a procedure the other day that, that uh, showed some irregularities. As a result of that, we had another test run Friday. And there will probably be some other tests that will be run. I don't know. Uh, but uh, anyway, I just did not feel comfortable about leaving out of town and not being here uh, when whatever news is going to come our way comes. I felt like it was my place to be here. So to that end, I canceled the trip. Y'all forgive me. Now, if you contributed to that trip, <laughs> you gave money for that trip, I would be more than happy to reimburse you. I want you to know that. It's, it's all there in our ministry account, and it was going to be used 100% for for the uh, preaching and the teaching we were going to be doing in Turkey. So just wanted to let you know that. You pray for us as we go through this ordeal. Uh, just pray that the Lord will have his will and his way. We're just waiting on him. We're just simply waiting on him. Amen. All right. Well, I want to uh, start out tonight in the book of Isaiah. I'm really going to use four different texts. I'm going to teach missions tonight as well. God had already laid that on my heart. Uh, uh, Brother West told me just uh, a little bit ago that he would like for me to take the next two Sunday nights and teach on faith promise slash grace giving uh, and, uh, and, of course, missions and what missions is. What do we mean when we say missions? And uh, so uh, I'll be uh, teaching and preaching tonight, next Sunday night, and next Sunday night, all in preparation for our missions conference that is just really right around the corner. And uh, I believe this will be what, Brother Wesley, our 53rd, 52nd, because we missed two years. We missed two years due to, the, uh, due to meeting in the school. Uh, but this will be our 52nd, and we'll just go ahead and say annual, missions conference revival, World Missions Conference Revival. We started back in 1970 under my father's leadership, and then after I took the church in 85 all the way till I transitioned in 2017, we had missions conferences every year, every year. And the reason why is because we believe that it's not the great suggestion. It is the great commission. Dr. Bill Allen used to say very clearly, and I used to love to hear him say it, and that is that Jesus' first recorded words in Scripture were to his mother. Know ye not that I must be about my father's business. And Jesus' last recorded words in Scripture tells us what his father's business is. And that is to go into all the world 
and preach the gospel to every creature. That's not only the Father's business, that's our business. That's the church's business. And everything that the church does ought to reflect that goal. That is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to every ear, to every heart, to all country and to all peoples around this world. And so tonight, dearly beloved, I want to, I, I want to give you some verses that truly reinforce that truth. Now understand this, what missions is. The heartbeat and the soul of missions is church planning church planning. That's why Matthew, uh, who gives us the method of the Missionary Commission, Matthew tells us to evangelize and baptize and disciple. That's what he tells us to do. And the reason why I say that the heart and soul of uh, missions is church planning is because only a church has the authority to baptize. An individual does not have that authority. There's no entity that possesses the authority to baptize but the local church. And so Jesus is teaching us in the Great Commission that the heart and soul of missions is church planning. Now, there are other ministries. There are helps ministries. There are hospitals. There are orphanages. I refer to them as parachurch ministries. They're good and they're important, but the heartbeat... The soul of missions is the planning of New Testament churches. And so tonight, dearly beloved, I want to start just by asking a couple of questions. Why is it that we have missions conferences? Why is it that we invite missionaries come to come and present their burden? Why is it, dearly beloved, that we talk about grace giving and faith promise and giving to missions and supporting missions and sending missionaries around the world? Why is it that we do these things? Why is our pastor leading us in this direction? I believe there's only one clear answer to that, and that is simply because the Bible calls for it. The Bible calls for it. I want to take four different scriptures. Now, I normally preach this in four sermons. As a matter of fact, I did last week. (laughs) I preached it in four sermons, but don't fear. I'm not going to try to preach four sermons tonight. But I believe you'll see very clearly from the scripture tonight. When I say the Bible calls for it, I believe you'll see very clearly from Scripture tonight that there is a call from heaven for missions. Heaven is calling for missions. Heaven is interested in missions. Heaven is interested, dearly beloved, in getting the gospel around the world. But I believe you'll see also from the Scriptures tonight that there is a call from hell for missions. Oh, preacher, really? Oh, yes. We have an account in Scripture where a person who was in hell and knew his plight was already done was so very concerned that somebody go and tell his brothers lest they also come to this place of torment. But I believe you'll also see from Scripture tonight that there is a call from the heathen for missions. You go to Acts chapter 16, don't go there now, but in Acts chapter 16, Paul was headed in one direction and the Holy Ghost stopped him. He tried to go another direction and the Holy Spirit said no. Then in the middle of the night, out of nowhere, a man of Macedonia in a vision came to Paul, a heathen, if you please, a Gentile, and made this statement. He said, come over and help us. Come over and help us. Oh, yes. There is a call comes ringing. Oh, the restless wave. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light, and they're calling from the four corners of the earth tonight. They're calling from around the world tonight. Won't somebody come and help us? 
I believe you'll see from these verses tonight that there is a call from the heart for missions. Probably the greatest missionary that ever served other than the Lord Jesus himself was the Apostle Paul. And in Romans chapter 9 and in Romans chapter 10, 9 verses 1 through 3, chapter 10 and verse 1, Paul talks about his heart's desire and his prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, a call from the heart for missions. I hope by the time we're done tonight that our hearts will be calling out for missions. I hope as we go through these three weeks and the weeks to come and our pastor leads us into this conference, I hope, dearly beloved, by that first week in April, our hearts are crying out, Here am I, Lord, send me. I hope our hearts are crying out in intercession and in behalf of the lost of this world. There it is right there. This is why we do those things. This is why we're having a conference, not just because it's a good thing to have, not just because others do it, not just so we can brag about how many missionaries we support in our missionary program. Oh, no, we're doing this because the Bible tells us to. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. I want you to see, first of all, a call from heaven for missions. Isaiah chapter 6. This is probably one of the most pivotal chapters of the book of Isaiah. I believe what we see here is both his conversion and his commission. And his commission starts in verse number 8, and he says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. I want you to notice the missionary verbiage of these these passages. It literally smacks with missionary flavor. As a matter of fact, you'll see in all of these verses the very words that we see in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Mark 16 and 15, Luke 24, verses 47 and 48, John chapter 21, verses 12 to 15, and Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. The five renditions we have of the Great Commission in Scripture, all of these verses contain verbiage that is akin to those renditions. Notice in this verse, he says, Who will, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Well, that reminds me of Romans chapter 10, where Paul said, How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe upon him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Whom shall I send? And who will go? Go. There it is, another word, another word, a missionary term and missionary terminology, send and go. And then he says, then said I, here am I, send me. But look at the next verse. It goes on into verse 9, and he said, what? Go and tell. Go and tell. Go and preach, go and teach, (laughs) go and be witnesses unto me in all the world. Yes, this call from heaven for missions is a call of commission, a call of commission. And every commission, dearly beloved, in Scripture, number one, has a person. It involves a person. He says in verse number eight, whom, whom, and who, whom, and who. And Isaiah said, here am I. Whom and who. I don't know who it'll be tonight. There may be somebody here tonight. God wants you to go to the foreign mission field. There may be somebody here tonight. God wants you to go to the domestic mission field. As a matter of fact, probably the fastest growing mission field in this world tonight is the United States of America. 
Did you know that the Philippines is one of the most aggressively evangelistic countries in the world tonight? And did you know that the Philippines are sending, the Filipinos are sending missionaries to America, to our large population centers? I wonder tonight if maybe there's somebody here that, that is that person that God's put his finger on. He wants you to go. Maybe during our missions conference, you can answer that question. And in a sense, God wants all of us to go. We're to go across the street, down the hall, down the way, into our homes, into our families, the places where we work. And the people that we're associated, how shall they hear without a preacher? But a commission doesn't only involve a person, it involves a plan. And I'm shooting through this real quick. Look what it says here. Go and tell, verse 9. Go and tell. Go and tell. Mobilize and verbalize. <laughs> Get up out of our seats where we are, our locations, our comfort zones, and, and go across the street, go down the way, go across the sea, go across the continents, go to the other places of this world. Go and tell them that somebody loves them, somebody cares for them. But it not only involves a person and a plan, it involves a people. Why he comes right out and says it. Make the heart of this people, verse 10. Make the heart of this people. It may be another nation. Brother Richard was just telling me his grandson's going to Zambia on a mission trip. Uh, you know right now in Zambia, it's one of the hot spots in Africa. Right now, there's probably as many people being saved in Zambia as there is any, in any other place in the whole world. It's become a hot spot for church planning. Missionaries are seeing the blessings of God. It may be a people from another continent. It may be a people, dearly beloved, on the other side of the sea. It may be a people right here in the United States of America, but a commission always involves a person, a plan, and a people or a place, you could say, if you please. Let's move on. Let's go to the next one. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. You all know this story. I won't belabor this story. And keep in mind now, Isaiah 6, in Isaiah 6, the Bible gives us a call for missions from heaven. And I want you to notice as I read these two verses here in Luke chapter 16, I want you to notice once again the missionary verbiage, the missionary terminology. Words used here that Jesus uses in the Great Commission. And notice what it says. The rich man is speaking to Father Abraham. Now this isn't a parable. Some say it's a parable. But it's not a parable. Anytime Jesus spoke in parables, he identified it as a parable. And not only, not only that, dearly beloved, he identifies certain people and certain characters in this passage. And here in... Verse number 27 and verse number 28, the rich man who died and went to hell is having a conversation with Father Abraham who is in paradise. All there is between them is a great gulf. This is an Old Testament story in that it is before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus died, he went into the heart of the earth, into where? Paradise. And Peter said he went and preached to those saints that were in prison. I can just see him walk in there and tell, I can see him walk in there and tell Abraham, Abraham, I'm the lamb that God would provide. I can see him tell Moses, Moses, I'm the fire that burned in the bush. <laughs> I can see him tell Joshua, Joshua, I was the angel of the Lord that didn't come to be on anybody's side. I just came to take over. I can see him tell those three Hebrew children, fellas, I was that fourth man, <laughs> like unto the son of man, <laughs> that walked into the fire. By the time he got done, he said, get a hold of yourself, fellas. We're going to the third heaven. And he hauled paradise out of the third heaven, or, or, or out of the heart of the earth, and hauled it into the third heaven. Dr. Tony Evans said that it was so cataclysmic that 
Old Testament saints came out of their graves and walked around. But this was before then. This rich man is conversing with Abraham because Abraham is the father of faith. The scripture declares him to be. And look what he says. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, thou would have sent him, he's talking about Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren still alive, still living on the earth, that he may testify. Notice the missionary verbiage that thou wouldest send him, send him. Notice the missionary verbiage in 28. He says that he may testify. It's the same as witness. It's the same as preach. It's the same as teach unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. You know what's sad to me tonight? It's quite possible that there are people in hell that have more of a burden for lost people than many of us do in our local churches today. I mean, he saw Father Abraham, and the only thing was on his mind was his five brethren. The suffering that he was going through was untold, and he said, oh, please, Abraham, please send Lazarus. Raise him from the dead. Send him to my father's house that he might testify to my five brethren lest they come to this place. Now, whereas Isaiah's call or the call from heaven is a call of commission, this call from hell is a call of comprehension. I mean, over and over in this story, this rich man and even Father Abraham address the fact that he's suffering in hell. As a matter of fact, the word torment, the word torment, if you please, is used in verse 23, 24, 25, and 28. And of course, in verse number 24, he tells us really what the source of his torment is. And you know what it is? It's fire. He called it flame. Yes, there is a place called hell tonight. And yes, there is fire in hell tonight. And yes, people that die without Christ and unredeemed, my friend, that's where their soul goes. Their body goes into the grave, but their soul goes to hell. Oh, I'm grateful tonight for the grace of God. I'm glad tonight that Jesus shed his blood for me. I'm grateful and glad that he saved me from that place that is called hell. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest incentives for missions is to keep people out of hell. Listen to what Jude said in verses 22 and 23. There's only one chapter, so I don't have to give you the chapter number. But Jude, verse 22 and 23, listen to, listen to what he said. Some having compassion, making a difference but others save with fear. Listen now. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. Oh yes, there's no doubt about it. The fact that hell is real and the fact that hell exists is probably one of the greatest incentives we have to go into the highways, go into the byways and hedges and compel them to go in. It's probably the greatest incentive we have to give faith promise and give grace giving so missionaries can go to the far reaches of our world and tell the sweetest story that's ever been told. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. But if that's going to happen, we're going to have to have a very clear comprehension of what hell really is. Number one, we're going to have to have a comprehension of the souls that are in hell. Why, in this story right here, it says in verse number 22 that the rich man also died and was buried. In verse 23 says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. And I know he wasn't the only one there. There had to be others there by virtue of the fact that he was concerned that somebody testify to his brethren lest they come to where he is. 
But we not only need a very clear comprehension of the souls in hell, but we need a very clear comprehension of the suffering that is in hell. The suffering that is in hell. I mentioned it a while ago. Let me just show it to you again in verse number 23. It says, he was in torments. In verse number 24, it says, I am tormented in this flame. In verse number 25, it says very clearly, Lazarus is now comforted and you're tormented. In verse number 28, look what it says. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they come into this place of torment. I know we don't want to hear that. I know it's not a pleasant subject. My father used to tell me, son, you ought never to preach on hell until you can weep over the people who are going there, until you can have a broken heart over the fact that if they reject Christ, hell will be their destination. Oh, we love to preach a beautiful heaven, but let's be fair about this. If there is a land that is fairer than day, in the Word of God, there's also a place where people are tormented in flame. Wish I had more time to develop that, but I'll stop with that right there. We need a very clear comprehension, not only the souls in hell, and not only of the suffering that's in hell, but the separation that is in hell. As a matter of fact, to me, this is probably the worst thing about hell. Look at verse 26. Beside all this, between you, us, and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Here's what Jesus is saying. Once you're there, you'll never get out. And that's one thing. That's one thing, to be separated from heaven. But the worst thing about hell is you'll be separated from God. Never again will you have his word. Never again will you hear his voice. Never again will you experience conviction. Never again will you know the nearness of his presence. And my dear folks tonight, in order to really embrace and engage in missions, we need a very clear comprehension of this place called hell so that you and I will save with compassion and save with fear. Let's move on. Acts 16. We're all very clear with this story too. It's about the first New Testament missionary that was called out of the New Testament church. We see the New Testament church surface in the book of Acts and for eight chapters it surrounded the Jews in Jerusalem. But the commission was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. They had a little mega church going. Nothing wrong with that. The only problem was, as Wesley said this morning, partial obedience is total disobedience. See, Jesus didn't just tell them to fill Jerusalem with their doctrine, but they did that in Acts 5 and 24. They filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. He told them to go on to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, and the word both there means at the same time, in conjunction with, at the same time. They weren't doing that. So what did God do? He sent Saul of Tarsus. He allowed Saul of Tarsus to step on the scene in chapter 7, he was holding the garment of Stephen as they stoned him. And in chapter 8, for fear of persecution, fear of this tyrant called Saul of Tarsus, 8 and 4 of Acts says that they were scattered. These Jewish believers were scattered. Good, good. They're getting it now. God had to make them go, but they went. I hope God doesn't have to make us go. If he wants us to go and we're not going, I shudder to think of what he might allow to get our attention. And so they scattered and went everywhere preaching the word. One of the first Gentile churches to be established was the church at Antioch in chapters 11, 12, and 13. It was there that Paul came. He was still referred to as Saul. He came. He was brought there by the Christian gentleman Barnabas. They met with the church for a whole year. 
They discipled saints. A great church was established there. And in chapter 13, the leadership group of that church was ministering to the Lord. They were having a prayer meeting. And during that prayer meeting, God said, separate Paul and Barnabas for the work. You know what the work is? It's missions. Do you know that is the work of the church? It's not a work of the church. It's the work of the church. For the work whereunto I have called them. We know that in verse number four, they were prayed, hands were laid on them. They were dispatched. And we know by chapter 17 and around verse six, we know finally the whole world heard the gospel because while they were in one city, one person who was full of the devil identified them and said, these are they who have turned the world upside down. God doesn't need a majority. God is a majority all by himself. If he can take five barley loaves and two fishes and feed about 20,000 people, he can take a little small band of people and shake the world for his glory. And indeed, he did. Well, Paul is set off. He and Barnabas took one missionary journey. After that one, Barnabas and Paul had a sharp contention over John Mark. So Barnabas takes John Mark, he's on his side, and they go one direction. Paul takes Silas and goes with him. And on this missionary journey, Paul is seeking the mind of God. There in verses 6 through verse number 11, Paul is seeking the direction the Lord wants him to go. In verse number 6, he tried to go to Phrygia and Galatia. And the Holy Spirit said, no, no. After that, they were to come to Messiah and essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. He was trying to go to Asia, but God said, no, you're going to Europe. And finally, the Holy Ghost directed him towards Macedonia. Now, God did a great work in Macedonia. It wasn't a large church. Matter of fact, it was a very poor church, but they understood what faith and sacrifice was. They were a giving people. And that reminds us that in this matter of Christian giving and in the grace of giving, it's not determined by your cash flow or your bank account. It's determined by your faith. Because it said that Paul used that church, the Macedonian church, to provoke those Corinthian believers to embrace the grace of giving. And I'll preach on that next week, the grace of But look what happened. It says in verse number 8, they passed by Messiah, came down to Troas. That's where Paul was from. No, he was from Tarsus, but let me read on. It says, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man, a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Right off the bat, Paul, right off the bat, Paul recognized this was the leadership of the Holy Spirit because look at verse number 10. And after he had seen the vision, he conferred with a ministerial association. He asked the deacons if he could go. I'm not making fun of that. Now look what it says here. Immediately, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And then look at verse number 11. He got right after it. Therefore, loosing, <laughs> loosing, <laughs> he took a boat from Troas, they went. Now, whereas Isaiah's, Isaiah gives us a call from heaven for missions, Luke gives us a call from hell for missions, Luke here in the book of Acts also gives us a call from the heathen for missions. The call from heaven is a call of commission. The call from hell is a call of comprehension. The call from the heathen is a call of compulsion. Paul was compulsed. Paul was constrained when he saw that vision. He wasted no time. He felt and sensed the tug of the Holy Spirit in his heart. Paul, don't waste any time. Don't look in another direction. Head on out. Go on to Macedonia. It's very interesting. It's very interesting because... 
There's other places in the scripture where we see this spirit of compulsion portrayed. If you remember in Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, the Jerusalem council had beaten Simon Peter and a couple of the other disciples, and the Bible says that he, they commanded them to speak no more in his name. Don't you do that. But we ought to obey God rather than men. And notice what Peter said about that. He said, judge what's right in your own eyes. But we cannot help divine compulsion, a spirit of urgency, a spirit of immediacy, a spirit, dearly beloved, that offers us no other option whatsoever. We cannot help. We have to. We must speak the things that we've seen and we've heard. They had a good old case of the I can't help it, and God give all of us that. A good old case of the I can't help it. But that's not the only place. I'm getting a little sweat. I'm kind of like... Wesley, this morning, I don't say syrup either. I don't say perspiration. I say sweat. <laughs> but listen to this verse. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and 14 said this. And he's there in Corinth, or he's writing to Corinth. He's in his last missionary journey. And concerning the places he's gone and concerning the people that he's preaching to, he said, it's the love of Christ that constrains me. It literally conveys the idea of a sponge being wringed out, squeezed and wringed out. Paul's saying, God is squeezing my heart. I'm afraid that's what we've lost for missions. Folks, it's more than just writing a check. It's more than just giving money and doing that part. Oh, no. That's why we have the Adopt a Missionary program. We want our people to be involved in missions more than just writing a check. We want them praying for them, thinking of them, and caring about them, entering into their labors, entering into their sufferings. That's why these prayer letters are given to each and every one of us. That's why you're encouraged to read them. That's why you're encouraged to write them. I remember God putting that in Joni's heart. And there's probably nothing that we ever started at Parkwood in missions that's been any more effective and more a blessing, especially to the missionaries, than the Adopt-A-Missionary program. I'll go to other countries and visit other missionaries that we support and, and some of you people write, and some of them will tell me, hey, when you get back home, make sure you tell those people that even more than that check y'all send us, it really touches our hearts. It touched my wife's heart. It touched my children's heart. To get that letter from that person in your church, to let them know that they've been reading our prayer letters and that they really care enough to pray for us and hold us before the throne of grace. It's a call of compulsion. Paul had to go. There was no option that's where we need to come to in missions. That's what this missions conference is about. We're not just having it because it's convenient. We're having it because we have to. Because our greatest burden, our greatest compulsion is world evangelization and getting the gospel around the world. Let me just say this, dearly beloved. This plea that was made, come over and help us. This plea was made because of a lacking they had. What lacking did they have? They had a lack of the gospel. They had a lack of the truth. They had a lack of, the, uh, they had a lack of a missionary. They had a lack of a church. My friend, there are countries all over the world tonight that have no missionary. They have no church. They have no Bible. As a matter of fact, in the 1020 window, there are some 300 countries that don't even have a copy of God's Word. And whether they know it or not, just by virtue of their lacking, they are crying out tonight, not only have mission conferences, but support missionaries and send them over here. Somebody come help us. 
But it not only reveals a lacking, it reveals a longing. <laughs> Just the phrase, come and help us. They know they need help. And they're longing for somebody to come. Somebody to tell me. Brother Joe West, he's with the Lord now. Brother Joe, after the Iron Curtain fell, uh, the Berlin Wall fell November the 10th, 1989. Brother Joe wanted to strike while the iron is hot, and three, him, and, him and three other missionaries traveled to Germany. They rented an RV, and they filled it with cartons of Bibles in different languages. And they began to trek their way and make their way through all these different countries. I'll never forget what he told me about Romania. He said, Brother Mark, Romania was so hungry for the gospel that you could throw a track out the window and by night somebody would call you and say, will you please tell me about this? He said, Brother Mark, I remember standing in town squares and opening up those boxes of Bibles and people pushing and pressing. And they'd reach over others and grab a Bible and when they'd get it, they'd start weeping and put it to their chest. He said, I didn't know what they were saying. But I could tell, friend, they were glad that somebody came to help them. When I first went behind the Iron Curtain in January of 89, the Iron Curtain was still up. Brother Joseph Oberman, our missionary, and Brother Peter Surovchek, who was in our church at that time, I went to visit them and their families to let them know how their sons were doing. I went to visit the underground churches that they were affiliated with. And I'll never forget how I would go into these underground churches and they'd say, Preacher, you sit in this room. And they'd sit me off in a room and they'd say, Now you wait here. We're going to go out here and see if it's okay for you to preach tonight. They said, They know you're here and there may be spies out there and we can't let you preach if we have spies coming. It set me in that room three or four nights. They said, you can't preach tonight, preacher. There's communist spies in the congregation. Oh, but one night they told me. They said, preacher, you go ahead and preach and say whatever you want tonight. Everybody here is a believer. And I'll never forget in the town of Novi Mesto, walking behind a, a, off a main street in a neighborhood behind a big old public building, we walked in this home. And I'll never forget sitting in that, kit, in that dining room, that uh, dining room, living room, whichever, but they had a table down the middle, food and drink on the table. And I was to speak to that crowd that night, and sitting all around that table were believers, many of them who had suffered under communism. And they began to give their testimonies. The interpreter was speaking into my ear. He was speaking Slovak. And I was listening to the words they were saying. And this one old man stood up, and Brother Ciarto told me, he said, Oh, Brother Mark, he said, this man spent 23 years in a communist prison for the gospel's sake. And folk, I'll never forget that old man stood up and leaned across that table and looked at me, and tears coming down his eyes, and he said, Preacher, thank you. Thank you for helping us. We were beginning to wonder if America even cared. When I came into Prague and got off the plane, Joseph's brother, Vladimir, was there. He received me when I came out of customs. He was standing there with a little old four-foot-ten pastor in Slovakia. His name was Julius Arpad Siarto. He was Hungarian in his genealogy, but he spoke six languages. He's four-foot-nine. I mean, all during that trip, he'd look up at me and say, Oh, brother. How can somebody as big as you have anything to do with somebody as tiny as me? I said, God doesn't look at our height. He looks at our heart. And as I lean down, they have a custom over there. You got to be careful, fellas. You got to be careful. Wesley knows. Uh, they don't actually kiss you on the cheek, but they'll just kind of peck. You just got to be careful when you go to the other cheek. You don't meet in the middle. You got to be real careful. And I walked out of customs with my luggage. There stood Brother Seattle. 
and I leaned down. And he said, oh, brother, he spoke perfect English. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. I just want to know what took you so long. I say that to the church in America tonight. What is taking us so long? There is a call comes ringing. Or the restless wave. They're calling from Europe tonight. They're calling from Asia tonight. They're calling from the land down under. They're calling from Africa tonight. South America and Canada and even from the United States of America, they're calling, won't somebody come and help us? It's not everywhere like it is here in America. The gospel has become old hat. We've taken church and Christianity for granted. And complacency and apathy has set in, but there are some places tonight where if you'd go, they'd hear. But let me close with that last one and I'm done. Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10. What we have here is a call from the heart. Paul says in chapter 10 and verse 1, brethren, now this is a missionary writing this under the anointing and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, in chapter 9, verse 1, he said, if you doubt what I'm saying, know this. The Holy Spirit bears me witness in what I'm saying. This isn't just the word of Paul. This is the word of God. And Paul said, this is my heart's desire. My heart is for my people Israel. He says that in verse 4 of chapter 9. My heart is for the Jews that they might be saved. That's missions, folk. And I'm here to tell you, dearly beloved, the burden of heart is the engine that propels it forward. What we have here is a call of compassion. A call of compassion. Here's what Dr. Warren Wearsby, and I love his commentaries, and often in his commentaries he'll make this statement. Love is, compassion is love in action. Not just love with words, but love with deeds. Scripture tells us, how can you see your brother naked and destitute of daily needs and do nothing? He said, how dwelleth the love of God in that man? How can we know there are countries tonight that don't have the gospel? Did you know in the state of South Dakota, and I've done a lot of preaching there and traveled there, did you know the state of South Dakota has the fewest evangelistic churches of any state in this country? The Northwest is bereft. New England is bereft. And even the Bible Belt is falling prey to complacency. And apathy. I'm here to tell you what we've done is we've lost our heart. We've lost our heart. Solomon tells us in the book of Proverbs, guard your heart with all diligence. The most precious thing you have is your heart. And you guard it with all diligence for out of it proceeds the issues of life. This is a call of compassion. It magnifies Paul's burden. We see that his burden was a very personal burden. Some eight, nine, ten times in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 9 and verse 1 of chapter 10, Paul uses the personal pronoun, I, me, my, mine. It was personal. That's what we need, folk. We can't live off mom and daddy's Christianity. We have to have our own. And if we're going to be effective in being a witness for Christ and reaching the people with the gospel, if we're going to be effective, dearly beloved, and have an effect on their lives, then we need a burden, a heartfelt burden that is personal. His burden was painful. He said, I have great heaviness and continuous sorrow it laid upon him like a shroud, and Paul lived with a broken heart. Continual sorrow. How long has it been? since you slipped out of bed and knelt by your bed and really prayed for a sinner. I mean really prayed. The greatest example for me is my mom and daddy. Some of you remember my brother Jack. He's with the Lord now, and when he came out of high school, he decided he was going to rebel. 
<laughs> he grew his hair long, started listening to rock music, smoking pot, left the house. He went from pot to speed and then on to LSD. And for a year, my brother ran from God. Now, I thank God that that run came to an end. He ran right into Jesus. <laughs> and I'm glad to tell you, friend, he ran a good race to the day the Lord took him home. But the thing that sticks with me is the burden my mother and father had. I remember as a 14-year-old boy laying in the bedroom right across the hallway from where they slept. And brothers and sisters, I remember in the, deep, in, the heat, in the deep of the night, I remember hearing my daddy cry out to God, Oh God, save my boy. I don't even know where he is tonight. I don't even know if he's alive, but God, you do. God, reach out and touch that boy and save that boy tonight. He would pray on for a season. And then my mama would start praying. Oh, I'll never forget my mama's broken heart. I'll never forget the way she prayed. Folk, it would go on for hours. They would pray together. And then they would sit for about 30, 40 minutes and pray again. And it was all through the night. At the end of that year, my brother had gone up He'd gotten in trouble down here in Houston, and he went up. My brother was going to the seminary. My brother Robert, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, and he had just been married. And Jack went up there to get away from the law. You can get away from the law, but you can't get away from God. He went up there to get away from the law. They were chasing him down here. And he went out one night, took my brother's car, and he found some people that were like-minded. They bought some drugs. He almost had an accident, accident that night and wrecked my brother's car. For some reason. No. This goes back to mom and daddy's praying and many other people praying with a burden. Not just praying, but praying with a burden. That night, Jack came back to my brother's apartment. He knocked on his bedroom door about 2 o'clock in the morning. He said, Robert, I need you to get up. What do you want, Jack? It's the middle of the night. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he said, I need you to get up, Robert. Robert got up and walked out there. He said, what do you need, Jack? He said, Robert, after all I've done, do you think God would save me? My brother bowed the knee that night and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, you may jump over walls and fences, but you can't jump over the prayers of God's people. His burden was personal. It was painful. It was propitiational. He makes a statement in verse 3 of chapter 9 that's astounding to me. I mean, Wes, this boggles my mind. He said, I could wish that I were a curse from Christ. A curse from Christ, apart from Christ, never to hear from Christ again. The intimation there is Paul is willing to go to hell if Israel will be saved. I say propitiational because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Isaiah declares in chapter 53, he saw the travail of his soul. He, God the Father, saw the travail of his, God the Son. So, and he, God the Father, was satisfied, propitiated. What Jesus did for us satisfied the wrath of a holy God. And Paul says here, if me going to hell or me being accursed from Christ would save my brethren, I'd be willing. That is an overwhelming statement. But it was prayerful. Chapter 10 and verse 1 said, my prayer to God. There's a call comes ringing O'er the restless waves Send the light Send the light There are souls to rescue There are souls to save Send the light Stand with me and sing that chorus tonight Send the light 
Sing the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forever more. Do you hear the call tonight? Of the West you go. That's Novi Mesto. That's the church in Novi Mesto that Joseph started. They built that church. Yeah. And uh, that was the first church he started. Brother Wesley's been there. As a matter of fact, that house right there during the World War II and, and, uh, and the persecution of the Jews, the people that owned that home, hid Jews in that house, and they'll show you the passageway where they took them. seeing that picture where that's the church where Brother Mark mentioned had him in a room to determine whether or not he would be able to preach that evening. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You've heard a clear, clear presentation of a challenge for world missions. And my recommendation for you would, would be to bow your head and your heart and uh, voice a prayer to our Lord and say, Lord, burden me where I need to be burdened. We'll take up a faith promise offering where you make a commitment to, to give a certain amount of money, whether it's each week, each month, annually, above and beyond your tithe for world missions. So I'll start praying right now and asking God to speak to your heart concerning that. Mark will say more about that next Sunday. Maybe you've got, become lackadaisical with your view of evangelism, personal evangelism. You haven't shared the gospel personally in some time now. Maybe that's where your burden needs to be. Dr. Patterson challenged us to pray a prayer every day for the next, next few weeks. Have you done that? Have you done that? Father, I bow in your presence. Thank you for the word of God, the truth of it tonight. Lord, I pray that you would begin to work in our hearts or that we would be about your business, the business of lost souls being saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. What number, Brother Ken? 